APIC Enterprise Module REST API. Um, who's familiar with the APIC Enterprise Module? Who's got access to EFT code? Yep, good. Uh, anyone been doing the learning labs that uh, are available for the APIC EM? Anyone been through those? No? OK, that's good. So this should be new for you. Um, my name's Adam Radford. I'm a distinguished uh, systems engineer. I've been at Cisco for about um, 15 years. And the previous 10 years before that, I actually spent um, writing software for a living. So for me, software-defined networking is kind of an interesting collision between my, my past and my present. And one of the things I've found um, quite exciting over the last 12 months or so is the work that Cisco's been doing in the enterprise networking space around the APIC EM. So just at a high level, um, I just want to address some common confusion that exists um, around what APIC EM is compared to ACI and APIC DC. So you're probably familiar with ACI in the data center. Um, common policy, oh, sorry, a policy uh, approach, simplifying the data center. APIC EM is the, the technology that we're using to simplify the way that customers run a enterprise campus and WAN. So those two environments are quite different. There are two technologies that we have for operating those two environments. But the strategy that we're working towards is a common policy between both. So we're not here, we're not there right now, but that's the direction that we're going. And what I'm going to focus on today is the, the APIC Enterprise Module, which is for campus and WAN devices. And really what it's about is trying to abstract, simplify, and automate the, the campus environments that you have, campus and WAN. So the model is fairly simple. You've got a controller that treats the network as a system. Um, the whole idea of this is that many customers have lots of devices, and things like quality of service are very difficult to deploy across a large network because you need to make lots of changes to individual devices and have those changes all synchronized. Um, the whole point of the controller is to give you that single point to interact with the network and to interact with the network as a system rather than a collection of individual devices. We've got some services that we've built into the controller, uh, things around policy infrastructure, things around automation that we've built into the controller. And then all of those services have been exposed through APIs, which mean that you can integrate them into other things that you have. You can customize them. You can automate things in a, in a more efficient way. So some of the services that we have, um, there's the policy programmer service, which does QoS and access control lists. There is some services around topology, inventory, all of those sorts of things that you expect to understand the network, to understand the topology. And then there's some um, policy visualization or analysis pieces that we've built on top of that. So once you have an understanding of the, the network and its configuration, uh, you then can get some uh, understanding around how policy or how things like access control lists have, have been implemented across the network as a whole. One of the fundamental things that we have done uh, with this controller that is different um, to most other controllers that I have seen is that we have tried to preserve the existing investments customers have made in hardware, and in many cases, software. So out of the box, you can run the controller on many of the current platforms that you have with maybe a couple of years old versions of software, and it will still work. So that was an architectural decision that we made based on conversations with customers, because we know that you love upgrading software, right? And we know that you love upgrading hardware, not. So we've tried to, to solve that problem. OK, so just a quick tour around the APIs. Everything in the controller starts with the, the notion of discovery. I discover the network device. Uh, I can do that via CDP. I can do that via IP address range. I can do that via credentials. So I discover the environment. I then build an inventory of network devices. Um, for a network device, I understand everything about it. I read in the full configuration. I understand all of the interfaces that are connected to it. I even understand the hosts that are connected to those interfaces. So I build a complete picture of the network and all of the, the devices, as well as all of the hosts that are on that network. 
Uh, there are a couple of other things that I can do in terms of location. I can integrate into identity servers so that I can do a, a, a match between IP address to user. So I've got the notion of user. And I get that information either through Radius server, uh, a Radius proxy service running on the controller, or through a protocol called um, PX Grid that exists on the Cisco Identity Services engine if you're using that as an authentication server. I'm not going to cover REST APIs because I'm assuming that most people are familiar with REST. Is that fair enough? Everyone who's not familiar with REST? Not familiar with REST? OK. Well, for anyone who's not, um, a REST API is really hard to use. If you can use a browser, then you, you know how a REST API works, because it's pretty much the same semantics as a browser. There's a concept of getting information, where you put in a URL and you, you get it, and your browser refreshes and gives you the content. The only difference is that, um, obviously, it's not giving you images and pictures in the same format that you would see uh, for human display. It's giving you information that's formatted in, in other ways. And JSON is a syntax that is used to format that information. And essentially, what you see here on the screen is JSON syntax, so keyword and value. Um, if you want to make a change, you can post. You can send information to the server. You can delete information. That's pretty much all it is. So the beauty of REST is that it's ubiquitous. It's very simple to understand. It's very easy to, to, to test. Um, there are a couple of tables that exist, or a couple of uh, resources on the server that exist that you can get access to information. If I want to understand all of the network devices that I have, there is a table called network-device. And if I look at an entry in a network device for a particular um, switch, in this case, it's a 3750X. Uh, I get the serial number. I get the platform ID, the version of software that's running the interfaces that exist on that device, uh, a role for that device, a whole bunch of information about that device. Similarly, uh, for hosts that are connected to the network, I end up with a bunch of information about that host, whether it's a wired or wireless host, the IP address of that host. Um, and I get to see some interesting things as well. Like I get to see where that host is connected to the network. So this is the IP address of the device that it's connected to. And funnily enough, it happens to be uh, 2.18, which is actually this particular switch. So that's, that's a hint that these two devices are connected together. Um, I get to see the interface that it's connected on. Uh, and one other thing that we have done, and this is, comes back to sort of database technology, is that every resource on the controller has a 32-character identifier associated with it. So you notice that the first. Um, attribute is ID, and it's a 32-character number, and that will be unique. So it's universally unique identifier. It's 32 characters, and it identifies that resource uniquely over the controller. Now, the interesting thing about that is that while I have trouble remembering 32-character strings, APIs and computers don't. And because it's guaranteed to be unique, it makes it very easy programmatically to, to link resources together. And what I'm showing you here is that if you look at the connected network I device ID, you notice that there's this large string that ends in 594. That happens to be this device. So that's how I actually know that those two devices are connected together. Because IP addresses can change. All of the other attributes about the device can change. But that identifier will never change. Um, it's very easy and very useful uh, just to, to look at those tables. So a little script that I wrote called host.py, uh, all it does is it just goes through and looks at the, the controller that I have and looks at the hosts that are connected or that are on that controller, the device that it's connected to, and the interface that it's connected to on that device. So it's a very simple example of how you can just go and access information on the controller and use it in an interesting way. Um, one of the other things that I put together was just a little report based on looking at all the network devices. So I've just printed out the, the platform, the serial number, the name of the device, the version of the device, and the, the device ID. Now, this is uh, something that's really easy to do. It's a couple of lines of Python. And you know, that's one of the powerful things about um, APIs is that 
a couple of very simple lines of Python, and I can print out uh, the attributes that I'm interested in, put it into a report, format it, do whatever I want. So everything on the controller is available through this, this API. Actually, one thing I should do is just show you the controller quickly so you can see that device inventory is actually that network device table. And this is just a, a quick view of that. But one of the critical design criteria for the controller was that everything that you can do through the user interface is available through an API. So it's one of the first products in Cisco that I have seen that has had that as a fundamental design criteria. So you can't do anything in the UI that you can't do programmatically through an API. Um, there's also the notion of topology. And this is just a way of understanding uh, how devices are, are linked together. So when I look at topology, I'm going to get back a couple of pieces of information. I'm going to get back a node, which is basically either a network device or a host. Um, and it's, I, I get to see all of those. And then what happens is there's a link that is used to join a network device and a node together. Now, again, this is where these identifiers are very useful. Because if you look at this particular link, its source happens to be the um, identifier five nine, uh, sorry, 594, which is that network device. Um, the target or the destination is 9FF, which happens to be this particular host. So I know that this link joins those two together. The other thing that I get to see is I get to see the uh, start port ID and the end port ID if it's appropriate. In this particular case, I know that because it's a network device, I know all of the interfaces. I know the identifier of the interface. So 48, uh, 48C would be an interface that is on that device. And you'll notice that the, the end port ID is empty. Any idea why might, that might be? So the destination is a host, and the, the destination interface is empty. Well. The controller has no understanding of the host, right? It doesn't manage the host. It doesn't know what interfaces are used on that host or any of the, the parameters of that host. So it doesn't know which particular interface is being used on that host. But it does know on the network device exactly which interface that host is connected to. Hence, it's populated that information. Um, one of the other concepts is this notion of policy and abstraction and simplification. So the, the policy APIs are able to be used for a couple of things. Access control lists, uh, quality of service. And once we have those fundamental concepts, we can also do some policy analysis. So you can analyze all of the ACLs that exist on a particular device. You can uh, find a path from host A to host B through the network. And for every node along that uh, path, you can analyze the access control lists on that path and make sure that a particular application is going to, to pass through appropriately. So that's the power of the, the analysis piece is that we can start to analyze an understanding of the network as a whole and get an end-to-end -end view of how a, an application is going to perform, whether it's going to be able to traverse a particular path. And we can deploy things like QoS uh, across the network as a whole. Now, these are applications on the, uh, the controller. So if I look at um, quality of service and the EasyQuaz app, essentially what we've done with this is we've, who's read the Cisco validated design for QoS quality of service? It's about a 380-page document. It goes into tremendous detail how on every particular platform you could deploy quality of service in the optimal way. Um, what we've done is we've taken that and turned it into a one-click application. So this is the 12 priority class model as per the validated design. We've taken um, all of the applications and we've put them into those uh, priority classes. And if I wanted to, I could click Enable, and I would enable Quas across my entire network as per that validated design. Now, that's probably a little bit of a scary thing to do. So you'll notice that there's also this um, notion of scope. And what I can do is I can tag devices 
uh, with a particular tag, and I can apply policy based on that tag. So in this particular case, I have a, a tag called core that I would apply to certain devices. And what I could do is I could just enable QoS on those devices, so enable it on a subset of the, the entire network. So one of the important things around policy is this notion of scope and the ability to restrict where a policy is being applied. Um, I'm going to show you some more examples of this because all of that is available through APIs. Now, the reason that that's important is that what I could do is I could deploy QoS um, through the user interface. But the challenge is, what happens if I have a new application? What happens if I wanted to change the priority of uh, Oracle traffic based on end of year processing? I want to move the, the prioritization of a particular application class. Well, I could do it through the user interface. But I said this, that everything available through the user interface is available programmatically through the API. So I could actually use the API to do that. And that would mean that if I was deploying a, a new application, I could automate the way that that got uh, added to the QoS um, environment. And I could dynamically change the QoS settings for applications um, based on time of day, day of week, some other policy if I wanted to. Um, the policy construct is, is quite simple. You've got the notion of a policy name. You've got the notion of a, a source, either IP address, user, um, an application, where you're going to. And then you've got the ability to permit, deny, or copy traffic. Um, if you permit traffic, you can actually change the, the priority level. Uh, and that's really marking traffic. So it's, it's making it prioritized higher or lower. Uh, one of the really good use cases for this is voice traffic, where you've got um, soft phone clients, for example. And you want to make sure that just the, the voice or the video for a particular client is going to be prioritized in a certain way. Uh, there's a partner over in the uh, world of solutions that's developed an application based on Microsoft Link. So they will take the, the Link um, called Detail Records, or XML, sorry, the uh, SDN API from Link, and then they'll turn that into policy and program the network dynamically. So in a call setup, it will prioritize the voice and video for those soft clients. When the call's turned down, it will remove the policy. So, I thought I'd talk about some um, use cases, because it's fine to talk about the APIs. But I think it's interesting to talk about how these, these APIs are going to be used. And I think there's really three classes of use cases. Um, there's one class that I call network operations, which is really a read-only type example where you're looking at accessing information that the controller has, manipulating that information, getting insights into the network as a whole. So that's quite a simple set of use cases. And there's lots of sort of efficiencies and little scripts that you could write to, to make it more efficient to operate a network. The, the next level after that is what I call network integration. So it's about how you take the policy APIs and you integrate them into things like security or collaboration. And what you're doing is you're exposing some of the services that the network has in terms of QoS or access control lists and you're making them available in a way programmatically that they haven't been able to be used before. So as an example of that, uh, Cisco has some technology called SourceFire that does malware detection. Now, when SourceFire detects a malware infected host, it knows what? The IP address. It doesn't actually know where that host is connected or how that host is connected to the network. But what does the controller know? Well, the controller knows where that device is connected. It knows the interface it's connected on. And it knows all of the configuration and the policy that's, that's currently applied to that interface. So it's possible through a very simple REST API call for the SourceFire malware console to remediate a host through a simple REST API call. And it can be as prescriptive as it wants. It could remove the host from the network completely, so it's got no access to anything. It could allow the host to just talk to a remediation server. And it's really up to the controller then to translate that policy into the most efficient implementation on the network. And it's likely to be an access control list, but it could be other things as well. So I'm going to focus on the first two use cases. There's a whole other set of use cases which are about 
um, proactive networking and autonomic networking where, or not autonomic, but proactive networking where the controller is taking a feed of information telemetry from the network. It's using analytics to understand that data and then it's using policy to dynamically uh, control the network or react to the information that's receiving. Um, the point about these though is that as you move across from um, left to right, there's an increasing level of trust that you have on the controller, right? The network operations things, it's really read-only, fairly low level of trust required. Once you start doing policy, then you're making changes and bad things can happen if the controller gets it wrong. And then when you move across to this sort of innovation piece where you've got this whole predictive, proactive networking going on, then your level of trust of the controller is relatively high. So I think most people are, are starting off in the, the operations piece with a little bit of, around integration, and then that's the longer term vision. Uh, so this is a very simple example of how the APIs could be used. Um, if you think about the tagging mechanism that I mentioned before, adding a tag is just a REST API call. So uh, network device slash tag, and it's a post, and I give it the network device ID and the name of the tag, and that tag will be applied to that particular network device. Now, obviously, if I have a, a large network, I could, through the UI, do bulk tagging, so select a bunch of devices and tag them. But for many people, and you can have multiple tags on a device, you probably want some other way of automating the application of tags to devices. So a simple, very simple script is just a script that takes a uh, identifier of some sort. So in this case, it's looking for the string branch. So any device that has the name branch in it, it's going to apply a tag called branch. So that's a very simple example of how you could use the APIs to um, automate the, or Oops. To automate the way that um, tagging is done. And everybody will have their own rules, right? So if you look at how this is done, it's really very simple. I have um, something that needs to find what a tag is. I've got a little routine that is able to tag a device. So it just gives me, a, it takes a device ID and a tag and makes that REST API call. And then, of course, I have the ability to remove a tag as well. And all it's doing is just taking a device ID and a tag again, finding out what the tag ID is, and then constructing the correct a REST API call and removing that, that tag from the, the device. So that's a very simple uh, script to write, a couple of lines of Python, and very easy way of, of automating tagging on the network. Uh, one of the other examples that came from a, a customer meeting that I had was a customer was interested in deploying IP address management. And the challenge was that, like many larger organizations, um, their IP address management up to now had been based on spreadsheets. So one of the uh, ways that the controller was looked at to be useful was the controller has a, a view of the network as a whole. It has the configuration of every interface that's defined on the network, whether it's active or not. And it's very easy to step through this, um, this interface table and you get the name of the interface, you get the IP address, you get the mask, you get the status of the, the uh, interface. So you get all of the information about the interface. So again, in a, um, a couple of lines of Python, it's very easy to go through that table, um, look for all of the interfaces that have an IP address assigned to them, and then you can print out a little report that gives you the device that it's connected to, the interface name. And if you're clever, you can use a little Python library that takes a IP address and a network mask and gives you the network that that um, interface represents. So you know, four or five lines of Python, and you've got something that will give you all of the, the networks that have been deployed on the, the environment. So that's a simple tool a simple example of how you can take that information and just present it in a, in a different way. The other examples um, are based on the concept of a, a routing path, so being able to understand how traffic flows through the network. So if I've got a source and a destination, giving 
getting a, a list of all of the devices and all of the interfaces that I, I would go through from host A to host B. So slash routing path is the, um, the API that's used to do that. And essentially what it gives you is it gives you a list of nodes um, and it gives you a list of links, as I mentioned before with topology. So it's the same idea. It's giving you a list of these nodes and sh showing you how those nodes are connected. Now, obviously, because it's a path, you know that there's only going to be a single connection along the way, but it's using the same construct as before. Uh, and you notice how critical these identifiers are, because this particular node, which is a host because it's wired and its node type is host, ends in 201. Um, that is used in the link, as we saw before, and because we know that it's a host, we know that the, um, the port ID is going to be empty. So programmatically, it becomes very simple to, to analyze this and to do some interesting things. The other concept that we have is analysis of access control lists. And what we found on the network is that access control lists kind of grow and get out of, out of hand because people, it's a bit like a garden where you, you keep adding to them and you never game to pull anything out because you're not sure if it's valuable. And people are reluctant to remove entries from access control lists because they're worried that things are going to break. Um, we've provided APIs to get access to the ACL or access control lists that are defined on devices and on interfaces. So that's kind of interesting because in a single REST API call, I can get a list of all of the access control lists on a particular device. Uh, and if you see that through the, um, the user interface, it's quite simple. Um, I can search for... ASR router, and I can get, on this particular device, you can see that I've got two ACLs that are defined, and they're called um, one big ACL for conflict. So that's probably a little bit of a giveaway that there's some problems with that access control list. Uh, if I click on that, I do an analysis. Um, and what you see here is that you see, for this access control list, you see all of the entries that have issues. So whether it's a, um, a correlated entry, whether it's a redundant entry, whether it's a shadowed entry, I get information about all of the issues that exist on that, that particular access control list. So that's available programmatically um, through this consistency API. So if I say uh, ACL slash, a, uh, slash conflict slash some identifier, I get a report back based on that access control list. So any idea what that identifier means? It's the access control list, right? So that, that will be the identifier for the particular access control list that you're, you're doing the consistency check on. So I know how to do a, a consistency check on a single ACL. That's pretty cool. I can do that for the, the GUI, right? I also know how to find out for a device how many ACLs exist on that device and all of the ACLs that, it, that exist. So I can, in theory, do a report on a device that says, these are all the ACLs and these are the, ACLs, the problems with those ACLs. I also know all the devices on the network. So I could look at every device, find out every ACL on every device, do a consistency check on every ACL on every device and produce a report for my entire network that showed the consistency or the challenges of access control lists. So that, to me, is part of the power of APIs because once you make that information available, then very easy to, to join things together and get something useful as a result. So there's a little uh, script that I wrote called um, check ACL, and funnily enough, what it does is exactly that. So it looks for every device, um, and for the devices that actually have ACLs, you notice that this is this ASR that I was talking about before. It's got an ACL called One Big ACL for Conflict, and it has nine issues with it. And if we flick across to the user interface, that's exactly the same information. I've got access to that programmatically. It doesn't look as pretty and this is not really for human consumption, um, but from a programmatic point of view, I've got access to exactly that same information, and I can use that in, in interesting ways. 
So this is going to go through the entire network, look at every ACL, every device, and essentially produce that same report um, across the entire network. The other thing that I can do is that I can start to link these things together. So I've got the ability to understand ACL consistency. I've got the ability to find a path through the network. So what I can do is, for each node on the network, I can make sure that a particular application is going to pass through all of the ACLs along the way. Um, again, that's something that is available through the user interface as an application, but it's just a, well, it's actually two REST API calls that I need to make. One to get the path, and one to do the analysis. So in this particular case, I'm tracing from this particular host to this particular host. I'm looking at the application called QuickTime. And essentially what you see is that I, I have an issue with this ASR device. If I scroll down, you can see that that one big ACL for conflict um, blocks QuickTime. So that's, that's what's causing the issue, why the, the user is unable to access the QuickTime application, um, because there's an ACL that's been defined on that device. Um, that's available programmatically through two REST APIs. And again, I've just written a little application, a little script that does a um, show path ACL. So it does exactly the same thing. Um, the output is not going to be as, as pretty as the user interface, but it's not designed to be consumed by humans. It's designed to be consumed by other systems. So if you look at what's going to happen here, I've got the path through the network, and this is essentially a whole link of those, a whole list of those, um, those links. And then I'm going to collect that path information, and then I'm going to uh, run the report or run the, the ACL check on that, and then I'm going to produce the same sort of output that you saw on the user interface via the API. So it's very simple to do. It's two REST API calls and just an example of how you can integrate this into a help desk application or some other system. This is also running in my lab in Australia. So the latency is a little bit longer than normal, which is why it's taking a, a little bit of time. Um, but it should complete pretty soon. Yeah, so there it goes. So essentially what you're seeing is exactly the same thing as before. And these are the, um, the entries that are causing the problem. So port 458, which is the QuickTime app, is being blocked. That's exactly the same that you saw uh, from the user interface. OK, so we've been through that. Um, of course, applications are just another resource. They have an identifier. So if I wanted to check a different application, I'd just use a different identifier, and that would uh, do the appropriate thing. Um, the other thing that we have done on the controller is that it's self-documenting. So all of the APIs are documented through something called Swagger. So if you click on the API button, you get a list of uh, all of the, the APIs. Um, one of the cool things about this is that if you go and have a look at a particular API, um, you're able to see the syntax, you're able to see the way that it's used. Um, let's say I want to know how many network devices I have on the network. Um, there's a button called Try It Out. And that's actually going to run live on the controller. So if I click that, it's going to make this particular REST API call. I get to see the response and I can see very quickly and easily how I could integrate that into whatever script or, or other thing I was, I was using. Um, just going to talk a little bit about integrations. Uh, I mentioned the policy piece. I mentioned collaboration and security. So these use the, the policy APIs. Uh, the policy API is very simple. Um, essentially what you do is you have attributes that match the things that you saw on the, the user interface. Uh, the only one that is um, not available on the user interface is this notion of a policy owner that's always admin. But the network user has an identifier, has some applications. Um, the action property in this case is setting a priority level to 46, and it's a permit. And the policy name is voice audio 40015. So essentially what this is doing is it's marking um, 
traffic coming from this particular host using port 12340 to be um, DCP46, which is real-time traffic. So this is just taken straight from a little app that I wrote to, uh, to prioritize uh, soft phone traffic dynamically. Um, when I create a policy, I get a, uh, a task. And the reason that that happens is that the controller is designed to be very scalable. So everything is asynchronous. It's loosely coupled. When you ask for something to happen, it doesn't happen immediately. It's not synchronous. So the controller will take your request, and it will give you a job ID back. It's like a little ticket that you, that you then use to ask the controller how it's going. When the task is completed, you'll find out um, what's happened. Um, so this is the example of looking at that particular task. And you can see that a task has an identifier, of course. Um, and what's happened is it said progress is this particular identifier. And what that means is that that's the identifier for the policy that has been created. So if I wanted to remove that policy, I would just need to delete policy slash policy ID. So I can very easily delete that policy if I want to once I've created it. I can look at it to see how it's gone, etc. cetera. Um, if it fails, uh, and, and policies can fail in two ways. They can fail completely because it doesn't make any sense. Um, or they can partially fail. So how does a policy partially fail? Well, a policy partially fails if you define it and there is no host uh, connected to the network. So if, for example, you define a policy for um, my, an IP address or a user that isn't connected to the, I, the network, the policy will partially fail. It will succeed in, in being defined, but it won't be implemented because there's no, nowhere to implement it. But the interesting thing about that is that when it's in that um, inactive state, it's still resident on the controller and still uh, available. So that the moment that I connect either as the user or with that particular IP address, that policy will be activated at the point that I, apply, uh, I connect to the network. And the interesting thing about that is that it means that policy is dynamic and policy will follow you around. So if I'm doing user-based policy, then it doesn't matter where user Adam connects to the network, that policy will be, will be defined and, and applied. So if you look at, at policy and you look at the APIs, it might seem a little bit confusing that a policy can be partially successful. Um, and all it said that it's inactive. And the interface where the policy needs to be programmed are not in the policy scope, hence you know, skipping the policy. Uh, similarly, for security, if you want to deny access, you can do that in a number of different ways. You can deny access for a user to a specific IP address and a specific port. So if there was an infected user that was connecting or communicating to a botnet server, you could just stop that communication from occurring. The other thing you could do is you could stop that user from using the web, for example, by blocking a, a particular port. Or you could just deny everything and block that user completely just based on how prescriptive you were with the policy. So that's all I had um, planned to talk about. Um, just some other things that are going on. There's an SDN boff down the other end of the, um, the center, down in the classroom at 1.30. I'll be, I'll be there for that. Um, I'm also doing a deep dive session tomorrow, or a, a practical session tomorrow, where some of the applications I showed you today you'll get to, um, to modify and edit and, and uh, play around with. And it's really just aimed at some basic Python scripting, showing you how the APIs can be used, allowing you to modify some of those scripts and um, make it easy for you to get some experience to get started. So thank you very much for your time and attention. Uh, have a great Cisco Live, and thanks for coming along. Bye.